war is a, is a ugly thing. There is no common sense at all. Not at all. I have been through it. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. They were building positions in there if for a fight. If anyone to us, by the time anyone got to us, oh, I think it was the chaos. weather was so bad, there would be nobody left. Boots full of blood. And the next thing I hear was alarms screaming. Of survival were very, very slick. The soldiers didn't want to go into the ambushes, so yeah. they'd send the kids in first. So he was sent in first into an ambush and he got shot in the stomach. It was very hard for me, very hard for my family. And the pain was Proud of the pain. crew, proud it's of like what I've kid. achieved and what I'm doing. The volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. Welcome to Life on the Line. To celebrate nearing the end of our second season, we have three special bonus episodes inspired by the History Hit Podcast Network. Earlier this year, I listened to three episodes on James Holland's Chalk Valley History Hit Podcast. On those episodes, James had three German World War II veterans as interview guests. It was insightful and utterly fascinating. One of the veterans remarked that he did his duty and that if he'd been born in Britain, he would have been a soldier for Britain. Since he was born in Germany, he was a German soldier. I found that an interesting perspective. I would never wish to forget or overlook the horrors of that war. But how often does one hear a German soldier tell their story? Should a whole generation be condemned to silence? Personally, I don't think so. So I made some inquiries, and the wonderful staff at Martin Luther Holmes in Melbourne help me arrange some interviews with German veterans of World War II. They have a story to tell, too. So I leave the judgment of their war stories to you, the listener. This episode is my conversation with Eugen Pikura, a veteran of the Third Reich's German army. Eugen, tell me about your parents' experiences in the First World War. Did your father serve? Yes, but both parents died after the First World War. I was a single child then. What year were you born? 1921. And how did your parents die? Normal to death. Industrial people. The mother came from the East Prussian area, and the father came from down from Silesia, near the Czechoslovakia, and, and that's why they had the name. The mother had a typical German East Prussian name, nevertheless, they were married, and after a while, father died first, and mama later. That's when I was, because I was the only child. Who looked after you after your parents died? Then I was living on my own. I was already 18 then. Don't forget my age group. And then had the flat, had to maintain it, and then came because I actually came from the youth organization. From first the Catholic youth, like the Boy Scouts here, youth organization. And then uh, when Hitler got power, he dissolved all those private Wandervereine, would we say, youth organization and Burschenschaften, academic boys. They had their sort of Burschenschaft and they were all dissolved, mehr oder weniger, and everything was taken from the Hitler Youth Organization, not by force, slowly, very slowly. And coming from the youth organization, I was a youth leader then. I grew up in this sort of milieu. Back when Hitler first takes power, you're still a young teenager. What was your reaction to that at the time? Nothing, because I grew up in a Catholic family. Politic wasn't... Wasn't a thing? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. In my entire circle of people who looked after me, they were mostly Catholics and they didn't mingle with politics. Besides this, Hitler had a a contract with Rome in those days. It was the the Nuncius Pacelli was then the man from Rome sitting in Berlin and they had a contract. The church doesn't touch the politics and the policy doesn't touch the church. And for that, if you grew up in the entirely community, which was Catholic, mind you, my 
My day began with church and ended in sometimes with church. This sort, it was not a real divorce in the sense, but it belonged to that. Then as I became a youth leader with the Hitler Jugend, with the Pimp, and that's the first group that pray. What did you think then when war was declared in September 1939? It ran past me. It, it was this sort of fatherland's gefühl, we call it, national pride. We didn't see the other side. We didn't see Marsh in Holland and our nearest neighbours where we used to live. In those early days, what was your impression of Hitler, not for his politics, but as a man, as a leader? It was, if you grew up in the industrial era, and that's why Hitler came to power. Unemployment, robbery, factories closed. The German love Ordnung. Everything has to be nice, fitting. And therefore, the people were sick and tired. There were strikes everywhere. Here came the SPD, the Lincoln came marching on towards the, fa- the fabric doors. The, here came the communists with the Schalmein music, and all of a sudden, shooting. Those little grocery stores let their rollers down, and then came the polizei per horse, and after the schießerei, the polizei restored order by power, by force. I was in it. I saw this situation on their hunger. I call it, it was the hunger for order, for Ordnung, was determined that Hitler came in because he said, with the SA and SS and the Partei Politik Troop, he said, I'll bring you order. Nobody saw this ahead that he started the war. I have to say that at school, our history reached only to the First World War, the contract from Versailles that we have been called to, to, to repay. The reparations are the, yes, to the uh, Treaty of Versailles. By the way, the reparation, Germany was was condemned to, in Goldmark, no states, papers, no online, or what we call it. You had incredible war debt to pay to other countries. Your currency went through the floor. Coming from your industrial background, Hitler provided a strong economy, I suppose. That's right. Stable society. Germany had to pay 395,000 gold marks, not in papers, in gold. We paid the last gold mark by the beginning of the year 2000. Can you imagine? And, of course, there were some sorts of... Vaterland, Libya, they didn't like it. And the, the contract from Versailles was exploiting Germany. They even took the church bells. They even took the organ and everything as for reparation. And that was the situation. And then, of course, Germany was not allowed to have an army. They had one standing army, 100,000, which was a sort of military. And then we were not allowed to have soldiers on the left side of the Rhine. Hitler said, not with me. He took a company of soldiers, went across the one of those Rhine bridges to the link. He marched across it. That's right. And that was the start of remilitarizing, of course. Then we had the, the labor service ever since before you joined the army but if you went I because I volunteered for the army I didn't have to go in labor service back to Ordnung he made land Germany was kind kind land with uh, a huge uh, food supply and it ha- it had to be imported and Germany was not that financial mighty so Hitler said, all right, we're going into the Sumplands, in the bad area. The Arbeitsdienst, that was the labor force, had to create acres. And that's how they supported the farmers. And all this, all this brought a certain regulation into our daily life. I can see how on the street level that is appealing. Things like construction of the Autobahn, it was yes. employment and yes. rebuilding the economy. Germany, in a sense, was 
emasculated after World War I, whereas Hitler was bringing back national pride. Yes. And national a sense of purpose. And yes, yes. Being a member of the Hitler Youth Organization, a little leader, I was a music troupe leader. What did you play? The fanfare, fanfare, like a trumpeter. And I, I was in front of the Führer three times, 34, 36, and 38 what? in Nuremberg. Oh, how close did you get? Right here, like the other side, because we were selected. The best music corps was permitted to, to go to Nuremberg. They had this party rally. Nuremberg was the Nationalist Party headquarters. And once a year, they came together and then, of course, our first troops, everything display would have happened in there. And so were we, the Hitler Youth Organization. And your plane leading your troop feet away from him. Yes. That was three times. I've been at the grounds in Nuremberg where that occurred. Langwasser, it's yes, I know. Very impressive. Yes. It was, mind you, it was primitive in so far, of course, it, it food, everything was provided, the tents, and uh, it was some sort of adventure. And, of course, you go into the youth, which is like scouts or kids. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it just grows as a natural thing, and then you join the army yeah. with no intention of politics or anything. You do it no, because you're, you're an orphan boy who needs a job. Besides this, uh, politics was not talked about in the army. I was not a Nazi, not at all. I was. We have learned history in our school. There are certain aspects which form or shape you in, in a certain way. Without being a high roofer, I grew up. I grew up in a staunch Catholic family. Within my area and my surroundings, there was need this sort of pushing Heil Hitler and anything that. Uh, it didn't exist during my time. And even so in the army, in the army later on, they introduced a sort of party officer from the Hitler Jung, and that means from, from, from the upper echelon. They are supposed to educate us in, in the sense of national socialism or anything like that, which was not, the people haven't been very active in this. And when the war started, I had this sort of uh, a friend of mine, he more or less, he introduced me to the military and uh, he actually, he went to the Panzertruppen, to the tanks. He persuaded me to come with him. I stopped. I had, during, before the war, I was promoted. I learned a proper trade in the electrical field and in my days, already the remote control started. And I was then already a radio amateur. Da -de -da -de 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 -da. Morse? Oh, yes. So I, I grew up exactly. And it was my field, funk technique, or the radio technique was my field, besides electricity. Of course, I was listening to all the radio stations when the war started. There was a Radio Luxembourg. There was the BBC, Radio Canada. Did you speak English at the time? Yes, a little bit because my activity uh, as short with amateur, we tried to communicate. I'm sure then listening to the BBC would have been quite interesting because they would have had strong views on Germany. Did you dismiss that as propaganda? Not directly, but it didn't affect me at all because, first of all, we were, everything was in order before we started Russia, and the, therefore nobody would worry about or anything like that. And, uh, of course, the, the BBC was then in, in German, Radio Luxembourg in German, and Tito and, and Associates too. But we considered this as a propaganda against our fatherland, which was in order. Everybody... everybody You'd only seen improvement over the years? Yes. What date did you join the army? 39, 1939. Late 39? After the Poland fell to... Then I joined the army because they were establishing super tank units and anything like that. Then because of this sort of, I, when I came to the Panzer Truppe, to the tanks regiment, I was seconded to the 
radio operators, Funker, we call called. See, in the tank, the entire communication goes via intercommunication. You have your microphone, your headphone, everything else. You're linked up on it. The internet entire network. communication goes via funk radio. This and then you know, I advanced on I was then a little bit promoted had to learn the voice dotted dotted Morse and radio communication and a secret code name. That was in Paderborn, the city in which I was born. I served my first time with the military, and then we were established to a huge, what we call a heavy panzer regiment, a heavy tank regiment. Then we were different in those times, medium tanks. Our company had Skoda tanks, very, very technically involved. In our Panzer 3, 2, 2, 1, 2, 3, and 4, everything had to, had to be operated with muscle power. Skoda had already pre-programmed. They had only a little lever, five forwards, five return, and you had only that little bit. Everything was hydraulic, which we didn't have which, of course, was a backlash in Russia when the winter came. The entire hydraulic was frozen in. Couldn't do anything with it. No. Let's go back to 1939. When you're in the Panzer Regiment, politics is not in the mindset for you. You are just doing the duty of the fatherland. Exactly. Exactly. Serving. This was always emphasised, that we are serving the Indian first fatherland. We intended during my time to invade England and we established the first underwater tank department. They were su supplied with the snorkel, which later came to the submarine that they could have fresh air to let their diesel motors open. But it was a failure in so far. They were supposed to go, go up to 10 meter deep under the coastline and invade, but we didn't get a water titan since uh, some kamerad died. Then that, that was dissolved. After this underwater tank maneuver, which failed, we established our regiment completely new and went down to Eastern Prussia, completely new and closed. Winter uniforms? Yes, up to Eastern Prussia, in the Masurische seaside, which is lovely landschaft, beautiful, beautiful. And that we were just leisuring, nothing to do. And then there came the first, what we call the soldier's parole, that we were allowed to march through Russia to protect the Baku Erdöl Felder. Baku. But until then, a couple of months, our Stukas and all this went over and then we started via Litauen. We marched from Ostpreußen via Litauen into the middle section of Russia, Nevel, Veliki, Luki. And we have been provided, very clever, we have been provided with Russian maps in Russian. And we had to learn basically Russian language. To navigate your way. Yes, ask for the way, ask for the daytime, or to ask for some food, anything that that. So this is 1941? That was in 1941. And so we had done several heavy battles, and we were in the direction of Moscow. First we went up, redirect towards Leningrad, Petersburg in those days. That was then cancelled. We went back into the middle section towards Moscow. That was the only, the only autobahn which the Russian had. And mind you, in, in, in those days, language in Russia was German. In Russian shoots, language was, was German. So you're part of Operation Barbarossa, which you needed to capture Moscow within yes. four months. 
On 22 June 41, that is when you formally invade the Soviet Union, destroy most of the Soviet air force on the ground. Yes. And you advance deep into their territory using blitzkrieg tactics. Yes. So you're part of the German army group north and you move towards Leningrad and then you turn around and start advancing towards Moscow. Talk me through the Battle of Moscow from your experience. The winter came. All of a sudden, temperatures minus 24. We were frozen in with our clothing into the the wet tank. Your arms would stick to the tank from condensation freezing. I can tell you some people did it willingly to escape the war because then it was unbearable. They would have their limbs frostbite. They, They put their hand out for five minutes frozen. And then medically evacuated. If they did find out that you did this deliberately, you were shot. Because that's fight for them, find the cowardice. Were you determined you wanted to face the Russians? Or was it this just duty? Or were you scared of the consequences if you tried to escape? Duty. Duty. I have been to very big battles, Kesselschlachten, as we called them, and uh, escaped until I was hit then in Malyroslavitz. I got a full hit and finally from a Russian T-34. And the T-34 was that type of tank which I captured in the northern part of Russia. And uh, yeah, I destroyed that with our hand grenades, took seven Russian prisoners. Thing, it was... It was <laughs> Hilarious situation when we finished a battle, then we established security for the infantry and everything like that. So we had nothing to do. And I strolled around in the bush and all of a sudden there is this T-34 for my eyes. I had Russian voices. I jumped on top and called them out get out. And friendly, they, they didn't, uh, there was no enemy ship, not like at all. They came out of the tank happily? Yes, yes. Hands up? Yes. And then I said, stay, stay. We were wearing, see, the army had hand grenades mm. on the stick, but we, panzer people, had a head in an egg shape. So I jumped in, pulled the trigger, shoveled it in the gun. Down the barrel? Yes, and then and then there was only oof, but so the gun couldn't be used anymore. And when I brought the, the, the seven Russians to my chief, and he said, why didn't you bring me the tank? So the Russians, you didn't feel animosity. They were just the opponents, but they weren't, you didn't hate them. No, no, not at all. It wasn't, maybe it has something to do with my character, my upbringing. When we, after a battle, when we had a arrest and security for the infantry, then I was that sort of tired. The heaviest artillery barrage didn't wake me up. That's impressive. See, whenever we had a battle, the people came down, battered and crying, I think that, uh, and we could speak a little bit. Then we tried to persuade them and things like that. And, and one event I never forget, that's why I mentioned German was first language in Russia. I just settled my tank beside a house, a Russian doma. A little boy of 10, 12 years come, uh, coming out of the Wo Sie gerade Ihren Tank hingestellt haben, ist meines Vaters Haus. In perfect Deutsch. Why have you parked the tank outside yes, my father's yes, house? Yes, it's meines Vaters Haus. And then I asked that boy, and that's why I got to know that German was Pflicht, must, uh, language in the Russian Russian school, school, schools. It was a language taught in school. Yes, that's right. And otherwise, after each battle, that's me. Not many people did that. And we didn't have any... Of course, we had a law against the fraternization, but nobody looked after that. The Russians were that sort of poor people, special well, after battle and so on. I always talked to them. I was searching, and then I had this sort of personal attachment to Russian people, which I can't forget. And uh, this sort of difference, 
I hope into my tank, but as a chief radio operator, I didn't have a gun. Or the other... Did you have pistol? Luger? Oh, yes. Luger? Yes. But I only, my streets could see because I was a commander, chief, Funko. I was a radio operator for, for, for the chief, for the CEO. And then I'm fully occupied because the entire battle takes place over radio. All uh, formation for the battle are directed via radio from the chief. And I was the chief Funko, chief radio operator. So a lot of information and orders are passing through you. You have that's, that's right. So and therefore, there was no no complexity with uh, with regard to being attached to Russians. The chief didn't say anything, and uh, but later, on, if the, if the winter came in, we we used to live in in their houses. How did you cope with the cold? We slept in in the house with the Russians. The Russian on the big stove, and, and we, we gathered around somewhere. And, that sounds quite comfortable. Ah, but, and then had lice, and lice came, you know, we, we, we did wash our, our shirts, anything in diesel, or in benzene, and when they were not frozen, dry outside, and when you hit them in the house, as soon as they were warm, they start on to crown and so on. They were sitting in in the corners, it was shocking. Before my last battle, we were friendly with, with our quartermasters, as we called them, the Russians. And they, they had one cow, and they provided us, us with a little milk. I don't know how they did, did, did do this. And uh, I remember one instance, as we were short of food, because logistic nachschub was bad. Your supply lines they were stretched were, very right. thin. They were frozen in and nothing came right through. And then all of a sudden came what we called a requisition commando. They were looking for meat and they wanted to steal the cow from our quartermass, from our Russian family. Of course, they had a paper that they are entitled to requir- requisition, cow or the pig, whatever that was on meat, because we didn't have anything properly. The chef, my commander, he said, you don't take, I shoot you. He put the paper in and went to the next house. So he prevented them to steal the cow because there weren't two little children in the house as well. <laughs> then we stopped, we didn't go any further. We lit a fire under the tank to warm the motor. The tank is completely sealed underneath our the fire, and if one tank was running, then tried to pull another one. This sudden cold, the entire mud, anything was frozen in the entire drive. The clutch was burning out. The motor was running, but you had to remove the, this hard, frozen uh, mud and anything like that so with the hammer. And uh, if two was, were running, pulled another one again. It must have really slowed your progress to Moscow. Oh, yes. We are standing. And mind you, the Russians were already on the river. When Napoleon got me, we were in this, in this position. The Russians were already jumping over to the west, and we were still standing to the east. They didn't touch us. And then um, I had uh, a special order to get in touch with the regiment. So I had to be out, go out in the free area, because the radio waves were not penetrating, we were our ultra short wave. And then uh, that frozen bodies, the Russians. And, uh, you could see the Russian bodies frozen in the snow. How did that affect you? At the moment, it's a shock. But after that, see, this is mankind, human beings. Battle of kids. Takes over. Yes. And then came the came, came the, the big commander, major, and, and says, prepare your lot. There, apparently there are few Russians broken through our German infantry line. Just make them fresh. Of course, we started our, our tanks until the group was together, coming in free area, left vault, front vault, right 
Shooting, shooting, explosion, left, right. We lost three tanks. When we moved in, my commander jumps out to help another one which got hit. And then one of those uh, from the Panzer, uh, who was in arm, he directed via our intercom system the driver. I said, left, right. I said, there is a T-34 coming towards us. A Russian T-34 yes. tank. And because battle function in tanks is in a Kyle form. Arrowhead. Yes. Aside, which is always a hot thing. You get not ordered who takes the peak. It will take taken out of the hood, you know. Who is the best one? That's the, the, the hottest position. That's all. Tip of the spear. But then he, he cries... We are getting hit. So he must have watched the Russian T-34 aiming his gun towards us. We were on the left outer side. And then all of a sudden, a big bang. I became unconscious. When I woke up, my leg was dangling inside. On my left side was completely daylight. The tank had been blown open. Yes, Luckily, it was not an explosive grenade. There are two types, solid, which just penetrate the tank, or whatever they do. Then they hit the tank, explode. Fortunately, it was all hit, but never it hit me. And then uh, some other tank, or a fall hit in, in the turret, he picked me up from the ground, and because they were shooting off me, I moved around the tank, to get a little bit of protection because I saw the earth or the snow, T-34, we were shooting at me. Bullets were flying into the snow, kicking up white plumes. That's all right. Around. So I, I roped myself to, around the tank. And, and you only have a Luger pistol. You don't have a big that, gun, no rifle. That Nick's gun. That's right. and, and then the other one picked me up and there was another gruesome picture. The commander of that tank... He was hit and the turret set displaced completely and cut his entire stomach, everything else, and he was pressing. It blew open his intestines. The man who tried to save me, he put me from the battlefield into his tank. His tank had a full hit in his turret. And the, the other one, he was... Your commander had been cut open in the belly, that's right. intestines yes. spilling out. And he was uh, he is saying, Hubert was the driver's name. Shoot me, shoot me for pain. But nevertheless, he, I saw this short ride. And then when he returned from the battlefield, he put me out again and set me on the rear where the hot air comes out to keep warm. And then comes another human event when we moved into our village where we used to have our quarter. So you retreated to the village? Yes. We visited this defect tank because he wanted to save me. He had to bring me to the sanitation station, to the first aid or whatever. And our matka, how you call it, Russian, Frauen, matka, was running behind my tank where I was sitting in the hot air and reached to me some sort of bot uh, bottle with milk. And she called Militakis Niks Kaput. I was completely helpful. My bind was dangling. And Your leg is broken. That's right. That's right. Uh, granat splitter. It's a fetch my, my Lower left leg, uh, sorry, lower right leg bone broken. Yes. In the middle of the battle. First, they brought me from the battlefield and they put me under the knife. And when I woke up, they took me in the U-52, which was a transport, they brought me to Roslan. And I remember one instance when I woke up again, I was under enormous pain and partly paralyzed. I had gangrene, green, Wundstarkrampf, in the Deutsche. So they operated you, you were still in severe condition, and they evacuated That's you back right. to Germany. No, no. Not Germany? No. To Roslabel. That was in the middle, halfway to Warsaw. Just further back behind the line. Yes, right. And then I was, I was flying 
as I was thirsty, and that's, I said, I asked the attendants, flight attendants, I, I was still smoking then. He, he should give me a cigarette, and he said, no, no smoking. <laughs> he gave me chocolate and it. And in Roslavl, there was an International Red Cross Commission. As I was suffering from enormous pain because both bones were cut through, they were dangling here. And uh, see, it's just... You're pulling down your sock, and I can see quite severe scarring around your calf muscles. And it's still on your sens- right leg. Sensitive and into the operation room. Then I've seen how quick an amputation goes. Beside me, while well, uh, he frozen. Frostbite on his leg. Bandages, a knife, a cut, skin peeled back, came a little so break up. Und. They put bandages around as like a tourniquet. Use a knife. That's right. Use a knife to slice open the skin for access. Bring a saw and just cut. Yes. Was he drugged? Was he conscious? Oh, oh yes, yes. So anesthetic. No. That's never had anesthetic. And then the rest on the, in the pan. <laughs> and then they just bandage it up, wrap it up, and they did that in front of you, on the person next to you. Yes. That's did my that, person, that, person next. I didn't see him anymore. I, did yeah, that scare I, you? Were you worried about your own life? Yeah, of course. The other day when I woke up, no pain. Oh, my God, this was a beautiful feeling. No pain. And also the person of the Red Cross sisters, all on a volunteer basis for the fatherland. They called me boo with him because I was just a small boy. Now his son and she, she put the blanket over and there was my leg. Yes, and then they tried to pepper me up. They took a, a water, a, the, the rin, which I was, what they call it, the wasser in the house, where the water runs in. Oh, um, on the drain? Yeah, the drain. They took that under my leg to keep it still. They use a gutter pipe as a form of a cast. Yes, that's right. They transported me, that was in Smolensk. And then they put me in a train up to Warsaw. And in Warsaw, they had x-ray conditions. They x-rayed on that. I was very lucky because that they supported that it healed together properly. It didn't have to break it and fix it. The bones had fused back together, correct? That's right. And then they put me on a French plaster. And I was six weeks on in, in, in that plaster. That's pretty good, considering the severity of the injury. Yes. And then they put me up to Österreich, Austria, Ipsana Donau, where I recovered. And then I wanted to... And then I came to the reserve, reserve troop, but I was not happy over there, so. And my wounds didn't heal properly because of the gangrene and stuff. So I was in and out of hospital. And until I was that sort of fit, I didn't want to stay as a funk lehrer, what they call teacher for the troops. I volunteered again. Rather than teaching, you wanted to be on the front lines That's serving right. your country. That's right. I got attached to the first top secret weapon in German army, the B-4. During his convalescence, Eugen was promoted to Funkmeister, or senior radio operator. He was then attached to the B-4 project. The B-4 was a remote-controlled demolition vehicle, a heavy explosive carrier. Of all German demolition tanks, it was the heaviest unit and the only one capable of releasing its explosives before detonation, so the mini-tank could be reused. The B-4 was a little over 3 metres long, its armour was 20 millimetres thick, and it could travel up to 40 kilometres per hour. Also, Eugen's work on the B-4, after his time on the Nazi Soviet front, is far from the end of his story. Keep listening, and right at the end of the conversation, he looks back on World War II, reflects, and reveals some final testimony of horrors he witnessed. Back to the interview. It was manufactured by Borgwart, a big auto firma. 
that was the before he was hit one ton acid explosive in front. It was like remote control tank mine by, by radio. And then we were uh, fitted with Tiger tanks as a commander tank, and their driver brought the, the B4 into position. Then he booted out and made that thing operational. Then he made what he called shaft. As only when the driver left the B4 could we control it up to 15 kilometer, if you could see that right. One tonne ecrasit, but that was only one company. It did belong to Hochgeheim, top secret. We were supposed to stay on the canal coast. We were not allowed to sleep overnight because we expected an invasion in the Rome de Abbeville, the closest gap in the canal. And then comes alarm and we were loaded to special trains sent up south, passing Paris in Paris where the locomotives lying on the ground, puffing steam out, they just had an air angriff in, in, in Paris. Then we went east, and when we passed over the German-French border, I had a special radio, a better empfänger recorded. And I listened, and the invasion had started. Can you imagine June 6, that? 1944, you're we, listening we to We were radio. supposed to stop them in the invasion night, they put us to Russia again, to the Ukraine. So they're invading in the West and you're sent to the East instead. That's right. That's right. Mind you, we had 36 of those demolition tanks. When you hear the news that the Allies are landing in France, yes. how do you feel? Are you starting to worry about the war? Not, not at all. I was only worried that we supposed to hold them up, be sent to Russia again. You just didn't want to miss out on the action in the West. The Allies are invading in the West. Russia has repelled the German attack, but you're still confident that Germany will be... Yeah, but and, and another thing is, again, because that was a, a, a sort of top-secret troop. In, in the Ukraine, we were fleeing because of our secret equipment, we were not permitted to get somewhere in, in a battle because we couldn't. Because the Russians were already nearly in Poland and we were still in the Ukraine. And we escaped from the Ukraine and then via Ungarn, Hungary, back west up to Poland, Krakow. In Krakow, we reassembled, went to some sort of Military training era in Oberbayern and in somewhere in, in, in Czech Grenze, where we got new fitted out, more t Tiger tanks, old B B fours. We were loaded onto a train over the day. We had to stay in tunnels. Then in Düsseldorf, we went. In Düsseldorf, I had my first doubts about the entire. Only once. Then I was standing when we moved very slowly with the Rhine Bridge, and I had a look to flee. And then I had a look. It was that high from the bridge into the Rhine River. <laughs> I just went into my tank. We landed in Bergisch Gladbach, re-established ourselves, and went down into the... Hürtgenwald, Jülich, Düren, just name it. So to recap, you've heard D-Day and the invasion of the West begin. The Russians are pressing very close to Germany. You've packed up your B-4 experimental radio-controlled demolition tanks and you've gone across the country. You're heading to the Western Front. That's right. Completely new established up to the Western Front. For four months, we stood against the Americans. When they came... And then our Tigers adjusted their gun to the direction. And then we, we, we were lucky because we were able to direct at two kilometers. And the Sherman had to come below one kilometer, um hit to machen. 
So we put them up, but after that... You had greater range. Yes. Hell broke up. They bombarded us, the artillery, three days artillery. How I was running for my life, under the tank, in the tank, thinking maybe they hit in the tank and they hit you too, and then a few meters back. Desperate. You would have been scared of being injured again. So oh, yes. Oh, yes. And after this was peace again. We picked up our wounded and the Americans picked up their wounded. And then on Holy Eve, or the Christmas Eve, our quarters, we were living dead with German in German families, prepared everything. The Christmas Eve is a very important day. They prepared everything. They came, the commando, up to the Ardennen. And that's where we stood until the Americans broke through. It was turmoil. It was absolute mixed up. You're now fighting for yes. the security of your country. That's right. And this is in the Ardennes. In the Ardennes Offensive, in the Rome St. Feet. Well, this is the height of the Battle of the Bulge. That's right, exactly. I, I was in there. We were sitting. I had a, a radio lap in my truck to repair things. And then my radio mechanics, the gathered, and I was the only one who had a little oven, which we heated with broken holes. And then I switched to Radio Hilversum. That was a special station, Dutch. And all of a sudden, flyers. He bombarded us, left, right. Then again, I ran for my life. I thought protection behind each tree. And then I just turned my body. There's nothing was sadly to see from the... They were that flying that deep, you could see the pilot. That gives you, that gives you a shriek. That gives you an angst. I tell you what, you don't know. It is just after that, back in the direction, Cologne. On Solon Bridge. You retreat. Yes, absolute. And then we came into the Ruhr Valley. We got enclosed. Where you grew up. You're fighting literally for where you grew up. Yeah, yes. The, the, the Americans had, had already a bridgehead and Neuwied and the bridge. The, the, oh, the Battle of um, Remagen. That's right. And so we tried to do, but there was no, no help whatsoever. And then I was sick of all that. 20 kilometers from home. I gathered my mechanics and everyone went his way. A few went with me and we went to the main road on there where the army is left, right and center. You have surrendered to the Americans. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Then they unloaded us. And that's when I thought that that's the end. They, they, they shoot you. Because sometimes... Especially in Russia, when we had an order of a battle, then it sounded no prisoners taken. That means you have to, in the old days, so that's and talk, you have to eliminate them. No prisoners taken. In the Russian front, you were not taking prisoners. Sometimes we get the, the order, the marching order, no prisoners taken. So on that incident when you arrested the Russian guys in the tank, were they later taken by someone else and shot? I don't know. I delivered them. There was some sort of, of point for the, where they gathered them. I, I just delivered, delivered. You delivered them and it was yeah. someone else's problem. So you're in an American truck and you're being driven along. You don't know if you're going to a prison camp or if you're going to be shot. That's right. Then they run into two doors behind some buildings and all of a sudden there was a half German army. <laughs> you are taken to the Rheinwiesenlager. Yeah, by Andernach. By Andernach. Shoved us there and then there was, uh, there was disaster. The Rheinwiesenlager were, there were 19 camps built by the Allies to house captured German soldiers. Yes. And the important thing about these camps were under the Geneva Convention, prisoners of war had to be treated to a certain standard. But you weren't regarded as a prisoner of war. You were treated as disarmed enemy forces. Absolute. So that meant they could treat you not to the same standards. They didn't have to feed you as much, that, not the same right. accommodation. And there were hundreds of thousands of you guys. They just threw it in a big zoo. Yes, but still 
I, I have forgiven them in my personal opinion because they couldn't handle us. They captured half of your army. That's right. They couldn't handle us. The same what happened with us in Russia. And it's estimated that anywhere between three to 10,000 German troops died while in that period of captivity because they didn't have the infrastructure to look after you all. That's right. And the other thing is we were informed about the Geneva Convention and anything within my military circle, nothing happened like that. No gruesome things. I was nearly seven months. You were there for seven months. Uh, I tried to escape. How did you try to escape? Uh, I volunteered for work outside. Means we had to establish new camps, prisoner camps, dig out the latrines. And then I had to go to the latrine, always with a GI watching me. And then I had to look, I tried to hide. In the latrine? In the latrine. You know, and you tried three to... minutes, <laughs> when I saw that, I wouldn't have come out. Our, but the, the, the watchman didn't let me out, out of his eyes. Must have been very smelly in that camp. Yes, it was. And then I got uh, the dysentery and, and the, the, I was completely weak. I couldn't move at all. How did you adjust to life after the war? First of all, when I came home, we were bombed out completely. My family, we married young. When we got married, the world was in order. That's why we married young. You married in 1939? Married 1942. 42. We, were, we would have been married 75 years last year. Unfortunately, my, my wife died last year in August. My condolences. After knowing each other for 77 years. That's how we stuck together. What was her name? Annalisa. Two children. Uh, since then, I have been here because I, I used to live in Doncaster. Drove every day to visit her. She is a stroke patient. She needs complete attention, which I couldn't do anymore. We sold our pliers. I moved into here and I walked every day to visit her in, in her condition. Tell me about your life with Annalisa, 1945 and the 1950s bad time because being bombed out for me is splintered somewhere. But the steelworks where I used to work were compelled to take us on again. And I was got as a wounded soldier. I was attached in my capacity as chief electrician to an invalid workshop. That where I stayed for a while and then I designed a huge textile Ladies' garment for a thousand machine. I became the chief and then I stayed with them. And then I received a letter from the beginning of the German New Army being attached to a radio technique. You were invited back to Germany's newly formed army. Did you accept the invitation or decline? I did. Left my job. Good job. I joined the army and then I got uh, ordered to uh, study commission up to the American Signal School at Ansbach. Uh, we understood United States Army Europe headquarters, Heidelberg in those days. Nevertheless, I absorbed some three months in the Signal School and being related to secret weapon, they put me into electronic warfare, radar and electronic warfare. So, and the, 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 we have electric comment on alien. Comment is communication intelligence and alien electronic intelligence. That was my electronic was my job. That's quite important work. Very interesting, but. Of course, all the, the devices, the Americans, they all gave us all the workable, our volumes and anything like that. See, our job was electronic spying. I can tell you there is nothing in this whole world in that very moment if you grab a radio-operated thing, 
nothing in the whole world which is not constantly, I emphasize that, constantly watched and listened to. I was in it. You were spying on East Germany. Yes, but uh, I was actually, I was not an operator. I was chief with the entire maintenance and it took quite a while until I got a nice government apartment. Everything was on, I was in a life position. Were you happy with this work? I mean, you joined the army with pride for the fatherland, duty served the fatherland, and then you lose the war. I imagine that was very difficult. That's right. This is one reason why I migrated. Because of my (laughs) military profession, I knew what was cooking. I had the the, 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 uh, transfer to the American secret and the German top. So I was constantly surveillance, constantly. They looked in which pub or in how many is what, because I, I could be a traitor. I didn't know that because I was involved in my work. But you were watched closely by the authorities. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yes. And that prompts you to flee Germany in 1961. Yes, because I didn't want it. Berlin crisis started. I didn't want to go again. And then I have I have experienced certain things which didn't agree with me with being a proper soldier, even a technical soldier. There are certain things. And, of course, having had some connections, I discharged by myself. <laughs> From the highest incense, the Truppen up to Köln, they were surprised. When they, when they saw my discharge paper, and it, it was just turbulent, the entire administration, the normal way would be I submit my discharge to the company. So the company goes to the department, it goes piece by piece. But you skipped up the chain. That's right. Coming myself from the Truppen up, which was the heart of the Bundeswehr in Köln, I did send my discharge. You submit your discharge and you, your wife and your children all leave? I applied to the Australian Handels Commission, Trade Commission in Hanau. What made you choose Australia? Because when I departed from the army, electronic warfare, I was still committed in case they would take me in again. And I was still for the next two years under constant surveillance. So even once you discharge, you still could be forced to be called up That's and right. you're being watched at any moment. That's so right. you know you need to get far away to That's escape it. that. I had my eyes. I had a cousin living in Vancouver. I had my eyes on Canada. But Canada is also a member of the NATO. That was the reason not to. I was in contact with Australia and with the ABC as a radio amateur. That's when I heard the cook, 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 in the radio. You like the sound of the kookaburra. You come to Australia and work in the radio industry. I started with the German VDO. VDO, we produced for General Motors, for Chrysler, instrument. The dashboard, the entire instrument, which was within my thing. And I'm also a reefer man, that means a work study man about efficiency and build up an assembly line. And that's what I did there, so I was well settled in it. Yeah. I want to ask you a couple of questions reflecting on the war itself. It, Firstly, did it affect you emotionally losing the war because you had signed up to fight for your country when your country was defeated? Was that hard for you? No, because I personally have experienced some unfine things which I... Consider that can only happen to if people lose their grips. Because I have been in certain situations which may, according to Genfer Convention, mass execution, hanging, we had to participate. Is this with prisoners? Against prisoners. Russian prisoners? War is an is a ugly thing. There is no common sense at all. Not at all. I have been through it. Occasionally, occasionally, I dream about it. Occasionally. 
the I have seen the other side. I have seen German soldiers. He just shot down two, three Rata, the Russian, Russian camp flee. So you witnessed and participated in, or just witnessed? Witness. witness. So you were witness they to... Have, they've been commanded to see. So you were ordered to witness mass execution of Russian prisoners yes. and the trauma of that, understandably, yes. made you lose a bit of pride yes. in what you were yes, doing. Yes, because this, when you see those people have to dig their grave, I've seen it. Nice heap behind, then back into the sort of barn, then came a man from the Generalstab, from the upper echelon, some juristic person had a piece of paper. Those people were arise up, and according to law, apparently it was retaliation again, again was the eventual early gesehen haben. Es war always auf dieser Basis. But it shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Can you imagine? Then they had to go on that heap of sand which they had dug out, and they came commando, and they dropped in on those which were, who were dead, and overseer came on. And shot them in the back of the head. I'm sorry or, to witness or, that. Or, uh, God. Was it more shootings or hangings? Hanging, hanging, I come to that. We just operated, finished our operation. Sitting in a village, Russian people came and accusing in Russia a commissar was the most important, important person because they were linked to the system. People were afraid of them. So some villagers came and said, oh, there and there and there and there. This is commissar. What did the leadership do? He ordered the people to us, and I had to put him overnight in my tank. Lock the door. Let Lock him. the door. I'm under, and the other day, they came out. We went to a certain place. I released him, bundled him in the front at the rear of the tank, that where the houses are. There were fences. Doesn't fade away. There were the, the wives with their kids standing, not knowing the army. We didn't know what was yet. They were standing, those two men, 30, 40 years old. And then came the juristic person again, durch Erhingen, because they were commissar, they were commissars, they were dangerous. They were undermining the system, the commissar. They had to build their own hanging gear. And the tragedy is they went to his wife, kissed her and said ade, not knowing what happened. There were, one was long and one was short. And they didn't fit the noose. proper distance. So they, they both had to, on the board where they stand, they push each other. The short one had to the longer line and the longer to the shorter line. Umgehängt. Someone kicks it un from under their feet. Right. And they had to had to hang three days with that paper wire, Commissar. See, those things... As a warning. I had some discussion with former soldiers. They glorified the German army. They had so was nicht getan. I have experienced it. So don't tell me that... Of course, here I, I have to put against this. The war is makes you crazy. You do things the under, under normal circumstances. They don't exist unless you are a bad person. And this happens in war. This happens. I understand why you were afraid when the Americans captured you. Oh, yes. My family didn't know what I did. And I, I didn't tell them any of How did you react when you first learned of the concentration camps? Flabbergasted. Because I can assure you, we have gewusst, but that such things existed because they, they, they guided us to a film they, they provided in a city that we have seen for the first time. This is after the war, you're seeing footage? After, yeah, that's right, after the war. 
We didn't know that such thing existed. You mentioned you have two children. How did you teach them about the war and your experiences? Nothing. Never said anything? Nothing. Nothing. Because occasionally when, if people come together, then we talk about these things. Oh, uh, besides that, they are not interested anyhow. They are not interested uh, uh, because they had a hard time. To, uh, and Angelica was one year old, and Monica, and that was in the heart of, from 45 to 48. It was a, a time hunger. They were suffered a lot and were very hungry yes. in their early yes. years. Yes, nix. Because of my profession and my trade, I have I had arbeit here, there, and dort. Then I brought a piece of sausage or, or some potatoes. We were hungry. And the, the children get uh, school feed sp- sponsored by the Swiss and some clothing and things like that. And look at your life today. You are living in a beautiful home in the Martin Luther Homes yes, complex yes, in yes. a beautiful country. It's quite all right. Landscape is like home. It's like driving into the German Alpen. Yes, it is actually. It reminds me of that. Yes, it's beautiful. I declare myself a, a lucky devil. <laughs> so some people say I reached 97 now. 97 now. When was the first time you opened up and shared your story with a stranger? I'm not the first, but... No, uh, occasionally here, there are some people, they have been through the war too. Occasionally, or what, if one trades it in, then one intends to... Also say their uh, part. Especially in regard to my person, if some people glorify it, then I'm getting wired. You want to correct them? Oh, absolute, absolute. Because inhuman one can be in that moment in battle. So Eugen, you tell your story because you have seen the evil of war, yes. the barbarity of it. Yes. You do not want it glorified and you believe things you've seen and your story can help tell the truth. Yes. Well, you have told the truth with me today, and I thank you for it deeply. Thank you for speaking with me. I found that conversation with Eugen insightful, honest, and heartfelt. I would love to know what you think of his story. Please comment on the episode on our social media pages and consider sharing the podcast on your own. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast and on Twitter at LOTL Pod. You can also check out our website, www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Subscribe in your podcast app to get stories of Australian military veterans on Tuesdays and bonus episodes like this one on Fridays. Next Tuesday is Angus Horden's conversation with World War II Australian Navy veteran, Rothsay Swan. And next Friday is my conversation with a Cold War veteran from East Germany. The Friday after that will be another German World War II veteran. My warm thanks go to Oliver and the staff at Martin Luther Holmes for helping to arrange this podcast. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget. <laughs>